Have you ever heard of Anna Mae Wong? If you didn't see the doodle that Google did of her in early January of 2020, then I will have it linked in the description box because it's pretty cool. Today we are going to take a look at Anna Mae Wong, the starlet that stole the silver screen in the 1920s. We're going to look at her career through facts, pictures, and quotes. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Gibson with Kaleidoscopes and Polka Dots, where I sell handmade, vintage-inspired jewelry for the girl who's in love with the past, wholeheartedly lives in the present, and embraces the future. If you love vintage fashion, jewelry, and books, please be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you never miss an episode. So if you're anything like me, when 2020 was nearing, you started noticing that images of flappers were everywhere and you were enchanted by all of them. You needed to know more and you went down the research rabbit hole. If that was not you, well, that was me. I was so enamored with this era and I am still. Not only have I brushed up on all the history and the fashion trends of the 1920s, but I've also fallen in love with a number of personalities, the Ariana Grandes of the time, that were really influential. I decided to start a new series where I feature one of them, her episode. To begin, I'd like to spotlight the story of a woman who really touched my heart. She is Wong Lu Song, aka Anime Wong, and these earrings are named after her. So who was she? She was the first Chinese American actress in Hollywood, and she also achieved international success, a feat few of any nationality achieved. Notably, in a memoir published in 1926 in the movie magazine Pictures, she refers to herself as Chinese or Americanized Chinese, but not Chinese American. She was fluent in French, English, German, and Chinese, although she spoke Chinese per her parents with a heavy English accent. Her signature fashion trademark was taking everyday objects and making them part of her clothes. She was a fashionista. Let's take a closer look at her story. Anime Wong was a third generation American. She was born on January 3rd, 1905 in Los Angeles, California to laundry man Wong Sam Singh and his wife Lee Gong Toy. Having fallen in love with the silver screen at an early age, she spent the money she earned while working for her father in the laundromat on engrossing herself with films. Determined to make something out of her passion, she dropped out of high school in 1921 to pursue a career as an actress. Her exotic looks made her appear older than her years, which helped during the casting process. Reflecting on her decision, Anna Mae told Motion Picture Magazine in 1931, I was so young when I began that I knew I still had youth if I failed. So I determined to give myself 10 years to succeed as an actress. Given her heritage and her youth, can you imagine the amount of gumption she had to exercise in order to follow through with this decision? Amazing. By 1924, she achieved international stardom and became the first Chinese American Hollywood movie star. As we know, the 1920s were not all flippant play for everyone. There was serious racism and barriers to entry for many. In the case of Anna Mae Wong, while incredibly talented and beautiful, she was reduced to only playing supporting roles due to censorship laws that were strongly upheld by Hollywood. She notes, I can't for the life of me understand why a white man couldn't fall in love with me on the screen without breaking some terrible censorship law. What is the difference between a white girl playing an oriental and a real oriental, like myself, playing them? The only difference I can see is that in most cases, I would at least look the part, where the white girls definitely do not. If it were possible to overcome this terrible censorship barrier, a new field would open for me, giving endless chances to acting in good parts. I don't want to play white girls, but I do think I should have the chance to play the roles that are mine by rights. Is the moral any different because a white man makes love to a white girl who is playing an oriental? I think not. Miscegenation laws were established by the original 13 colonies and they were upheld until 1967 by many states. These laws enforced racial segregation at the level of marriage and intimate relationships by criminalizing interracial marriage between members of different races. Given the severe prejudice against people of Asian ancestry, there was also a fear that theater chains around the country would refuse to show movies with an interracial couple, 
even if according to the storyline, they were both of the same ethnicity. The Motion Picture Production Code of 1934 further worked towards enforcing miscegenation laws on screen. Of course, this code worked against Anami's career in Hollywood. Java Head from 1934 was the only film where she kissed a male white lead, her husband, in the film. She considered this project a personal favorite. Given Hollywood's adherence to these infuriating and antiquated laws, she was confined to taking on supporting roles where she was portrayed as either the naive and self-sacrificing butterfly or the sly and deceitful dragon lady. These are starkly different roles, but they share a common theme. She notes, When I die, my epitaph should be, I died a thousand deaths. That was the story of my film career. Most of the time I played in mystery and intrigue stories. They didn't know what to do with me at the end, so they killed me off. Anime Wong took on her first major role when she was only 17. She starred in the movie The Toll of the Sea, which was loosely based on Madama Butterfly in opera. Her character perpetuated the stereotype of the Asian Lotus Blossom, a self-sacrificial woman who surrendered her life for the love of a Caucasian man. Praise for her performance was incredible. Variety Magazine, extraordinarily fine acting, The New York Times, Miss Wong stirs in the spectator all the sympathy her parts call for and she never repels one by excess of theatrical feeling. She has a difficult role, a role that is botched nine times out of ten, but hers is the tenth performance, completely unconscious of the camera with a fine sense of proportion and remarkable pantomimic accuracy. She should be seen again and often on screen. With such praise, you'd think that Hollywood would react positively, right? No. Being typecast war on Anami's last nerve, and so in 1928, she moved to Europe where she soared. In 1928, she starred in Song and Show Live, and in 1929, starred in Pavement Butterfly. The New York Times reported that Wong was acclaimed not only as an actress of transcendent talent, but as a great beauty by German critics. They neglect to mention that Anna May is of American birth. They mention only her Chinese origins. In Europe, Anna May was appreciated. Her talent and beauty exulted. She learned German and French, which would assist her in her rise to international stardom. She befriended Marlene Dietrich and hobnobbed with the intellectual elite that included princes, playwrights, artists, and photographers who clamored to work with her. She was featured in magazines all over the world. She was a leading lady everywhere but in the United States. In 1929, she starred in Piccadilly, a British silent drama. It was a sensation in the UK. She starred alongside Gilda Gray, a top billed actress. Variety commented that Anna May outshines the star from the moment Miss Wong dances it in the kitchen's rear. She steals Piccadilly from Miss Gray. This was Anna May's most sensual role yet she did not kiss her Caucasian love interest. I'll leave a link to a short clip of it in the description box. In 1932, she starred alongside Marlene Dietrich in Shanghai Express, a pre-code film directed by Joseph von Sternberg. This was one of her best supporting roles in Hollywood. The film won an Oscar. Today, film historians seem to agree that she upstaged Marlene Dietrich. And I totally agree. As we can see, again and again, she steals the stage, she captivates audiences, yet Hollywood is daft. In 1935, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer refused to consider her for the leading role of the Chinese character Olan in the film version of that Pearl S. Buck's The Good Earth. Instead, they cast the white actress Louise Rayner. She received an Academy Award in 1937 for her performance. Anna Mae Wong was interviewed in 1933 by Film Weekly in the article titled, I Protest, where she notes, There seems little for me in Hollywood because rather than real Chinese, producers prefer Hungarians, Mexicans, American Indians for Chinese roles. Yellow face was commonly used in the 1920s by European American performers to depict people of East Asian cultures. These representations were often an ethnocentric perception of East Asians rather than an authentic depiction of their cultures, customs, and behaviors. While not as prevalent and not as atrocious in its depiction of East Asians, this practice continues. In the same interview of the negative stereotyping in Daughter of the Dragon, she notes, 
Why is it that the screen Chinese is always the villain? And so crude a villain. Murderous, treacherous, a snake in the grass. We are not like that. How could we be with a civilization that is so many times older than the West? Following MGM's refusal to consider her for the role of Olan, Anna Mae Wong spent the next year touring China. Unfortunately, she would not always be received with a warm reception. While touring her parents' village in China, people showed up to protest her visit. She was viewed negatively here as the roles she was forced to play were considered disgraceful. To make matters worse, actresses were equated with prostitutes, and her status as a single woman of a certain age was not readily accepted. Of this, she said, It's a pretty sad situation to be rejected by the Chinese because I am too American. If you can relate to her in any way, share your story in the comments. Anna Mae Wong's pursuit of justice was most evident during the war. She starred in Bombs Over Burma in 1942 and Lady from Chongqing again in 1942, which were both anti-Japanese propaganda. The Lady from Chongqing differed from the usual Hollywood war film in that the Chinese were portrayed as heroes rather than as victims rescued by the Americans and the villains were played by European Americans instead of Chinese American actors. She donated her salary from both of these films to the United China Relief. Quote, I am Chinese by race and I love Chinese people and things. I love our traditions and even our ancient religions. I think there is poetry in our plural gods of the North Wind and the West Wind and the like. They are beautiful like the American Indian gods. My only regret is the limitation upon my work as I can only play oriental roles or sometimes Indian parts. Anna Mae took a six year break from filming any movies. In 1951, she started in a detective series, The Gallery of Madame Lu Song, where she played a detective. This was the role that was specifically written for her and it was the first television series to star an Asian American lead. Anna Mae never married. This could be a result of miscegenation love as she was mostly involved with Caucasian men or her lack of wants. She died of a heart attack on February 3rd of 1961. Unfortunately, I could only cover a small part about her story. If you would like to learn more about her, I will leave a link to all of my sources in the description box, along with a link to my newsletter. When you sign up, you get a 20% off discount code, which you can use at any point, anytime, and as often as you want. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please give me a like, please subscribe, and hit that notification bell, and I will see you very soon. Thank you so much for your time. Bye. If you didn't see the little Google Doodle, Google Doodle, Google Doodle. Try saying that a hundred times. I have. <laughs> it's not easy. If you didn't see the Google Doodle, the Doodle Google,